Everybody, please stand for the for the uh, pledge. I think Devin's checking to see if we're on TV. We can do this without being on There we go. Okay. There we go. Nope. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mark, take the roll, please. O'Connor. Here. Morissette. Here. Holmes. Accent. Thank you. Dezeal. Here. Weber. Here. Hall. Here. All right, everybody have a chance to, oh, um, I guess we're doing the public hearing first. We have a uh, public hearing on a comprehensive plan amendment to adopt the Hudson Waterfront Vision Study. Is anybody here for the public hearing? It's your opportunity to speak to this issue. Anybody here for the public hearing? Anybody here for the public hearing? Move to close. Second. Anybody here for the public hearing? <laughs> Got a motion and second to, uh, to close the public hearing. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Public hearing is closed. Uh, we now have uh, on the agenda comments and suggestions from citizens present. Is there anybody here that would like to say anything? Greg? Welcome. Again, state your name and address, please. Sure. Good evening, Council. Mayor. Uh, my name is Greg Sarno. I live at 1412 Laurel Avenue here in Hudson. I believe that's District 3. Mm -hmm. After finishing this morning's Sudoku and crossword puzzle, um, Monday isn't very tough, so it's pretty easy. I happened to look at the local section of yesterday's Sunday Pioneer Press I was intrigued by, I, by what I saw on page 6B. There was Tony Ball's picture, and I soon realized I was reading about a hate group in our little town of Hudson. I couldn't believe what I was reading. This was obviously not the Hudson I knew and loved, was it? And the more I read, the madder I got. Some thoughts. As far as I know, after living here in Hudson for almost 27 years, there is no illegal segregation by race, creed, religious belief, language, sexual orientation, height, weight, or hair color in the city of Hudson. You can buy a car, you can buy a house, you can buy a boat, you can buy a hot dog, you can buy groceries, you can buy diapers, you can go to the movies, and you can walk along the riverfront safely and without any harassment by the vast majority of Hudsonites. I'm making comments about the, the article, as, as you might be able to tell. Um, I do have a, a note for the Hudson Inclusion Alliance. I think they need to be careful with who they associate with. The Southern Poverty Law Center is a far, far left organization. And the FBI, in 2014, stopped citing the SBPLC as a hate crime resource due to its accuracy concerns. It has worked in the past to incite crime around the country. Its hate group numbers are known to be inflated, and its highly political fundraising efforts are very much illegal for any nonprofit 501c3 organization which it claims to be. Uh, in the article, the story of a high school girl here in Hudson who had her feelings hurt at a football game was definitely unfortunate. Kids and adults say some stupid, hurtful things all the time. All you have to do is look at Facebook. That was an individual incident and not a systemic problem, and I sincerely hope her folks can help her to ignore these idiots um, when they come around. Regarding the article, I do like what Joyce Hall said, that we as leaders should be setting examples for our children. I would like to add to that by saying we as leaders should be setting the examples for our children with our actions. Um, and we already have the U.S. Constitution and the Wisconsin state law to address any actions when the actions are illegal. Um, the article was primarily about the citizens for the St. Croix County and their uh, attitudes against Sharia law or Sharia law in general. I just wanted to share from, with you a couple of things I saw on the web today. Literally within three clicks, you can come up with a whole bunch of things on Sharia law. And this is the institution 
that citizens for the St. Croix Council, St. Croix Valley, excuse me, are worried about. Under Sharia law, there is no freedom of religion. Under Sharia law, there is no freedom of speech. Under freedom of religion, there is no freedom of the press. Women do not have equal rights, and homosexuality, homosexuality is illegal and punishable by death. Um, they're worried about it. I'm worried about it in the United States of America, and I would wonder why anybody else wouldn't be worried about it as well. And just to make things clear, finally, I make this pledge to the Hudson Inclusion for Alliance. If anyone refuses to sell you a house or a car based on your religion or sexual orientation, or if you are ever forbidden from voting in Hudson because of your religion or sexual orientation, or if you're ever forbidden from sending your children to the Hudson Public Schools based on your religion or sexual orientation, please give me a call. I will come and help you out. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Greg. Any other comments? Any other comments? Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll close that portion of the agenda. Discussion of possible action on consent agenda items. To approve the regular meeting minutes of May 7, 2018, to approve claims in the amount of $447,599.06, contingent on payment of any outstanding debt owed to the city and successful completion of the background check, to approve the issuance of 22 regular off-brighter licenses on file in the city clerk's office for the period of May 22, 2018 to June 30, 2020, and to also approve one temporary operator license to John Herring for the Hudson Booster Days. To approve the amusement device owner's license to Twin States Music Inc. and 52 Games, Leisure Entertainment RW LLC, and 33 Games and Namco U USA Inc. Um, 11 Games, contingent on payment of any outstanding debt owed to the city and completion of the background check. To place on file the public utilities first quarter report. To place on file the May 8, 2018 Public Utility Commission meeting minutes. To approve the Hudson Booster Days event from June 29th to July 1st, 2018 with contingencies listed. To approve the temporary Class B beer and wine license for the Hudson Boosters for June 28th to July 1st, 2018. To approve a temporary Class B beer license for Backcountry Brewfest on July 14th, 2018. To approve the special event permit for the Gopher to Badger race on August 10th and 11th, 2018, and uh, allowing the start time of the event to begin at 4.30 a.m., contingent on the payment by the organizer for any charges to hire police officers or any extra public works, parks, EMS staff, and that signage be picked up at the completion of the event. To approve no parking on the north side of Hanley Road between Namacoggin Street and Foxglove Way, and to review the issue in six months. To approve no parking on Oak Street between 4th and 5th Street during school hours for bus drop-off and pickup, and to recommend student pickup on drop-off parking on 4th Street between St. Croix Street and Oak Street. To approve installing slow children at play signage on Diamond Drive between Vine Street and Ruby Road. To approve the Backcountry Brewfest on Saturday, July 14, 2018 from 2 to 8 p.m. at Lakefront Park to enter into an easement agreement with Allison Lester and Wells Larson for the purpose of constructing a fence with an, an e existing utility easement, uh, to approve the certified survey map at 1228 10th Street submitted by Creative Homes, Inc., to set a public hearing date of June 18, 2018 for a zoning map amendment for a parcel owned by Lois Corn Corn Cornwall Trust, and to set a public hearing date of June 18, 2018 for a zoning map amendment for a parcel located at 1308 2nd Street. Move for approval. Second. Got a motion second for approval. Roll call. Morissette? Yes. Zazeel? Yes. Weber? Yes. Hall? Yes. Motion's approved. Unfinished business. Blake, on our room tax presentation. Blake, uh, as you know, he is uh, from the Hudson Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Bureau, and he is here tonight to present a room tax report. Uh, the City of Hudson, we uh, collect a 3% room tax. Uh, per Wisconsin statute, 70% of that room tax uh, must be dedicated to tourism and promotion and development. 
um, and the city sends that 70% to the Hudson Chamber of Commerce and Tourism Bureau. Uh, uh, per statutes, an annual report must be presented to, by the tourism entity or the Hudson Chamber of Commerce and Tur Tourism Bureau um, to the city, and that's Blake's here tonight to present that report. Thank you. I'm also joined this evening by Mary Weller, our Director of Tourism. She's actually the one who put together the report. Uh, we wanted to send that report to you in advance, um, so you should have received that by email. We wanted you to, uh, it's, it's a lengthy report. We had about five minutes tonight, so we didn't want to go through everything that you'll find in that report. What we tried to do was highlight what we do in terms of tourism promotion. What does that look like? What are the various forms it takes? I often tell people during our chamber orientation that it's the invisible thing primarily for people who live here because you're already here. We're not trying to attract you to come to Hudson. So throughout that, you got to saw, see some of the advertisements we place in publications throughout the region, throughout the upper Midwest, as well as uh, highlights for our Discover Wisconsin episodes and some of the efforts we take. Also included in that report was a bar graph that showed the growth in our room tax collections, our dramatic growth in room tax collections in the city of Hudson over the last 10 years. Uh, what makes this even more dramatic is there has been no increase in the room tax rate. I often kid that our room tax rate at 3%, I don't kid, this is an actual fact. I was once asked to complete a survey um, listing various aspects of our tourism efforts and one of the questions was, what's your room tax rate? The lowest option was 4%. 3% wasn't even something I could <laughs> click. That was a required question of the survey, so I couldn't complete the survey. Um, it's a low room tax, uh, but we have been able to increase the collections from that dramatically over the last 10 years. Um, after we submitted that report, we were able to obtain, for the first time ever, um, data on the economic impact of tourism on the city of Hudson. I want to take some time highlighting that. Um, if you're in a market like Eau Claire, La Crosse, Madison, Milwaukee, this type of data is provided for you quite frequently uh, on a periodic basis. We have never been able to have an opportunity to divide Wisconsin, Hudson numbers out from the larger regional numbers. So just want to take a quick moment to talk about what tourism means for the city of Hudson. And if you would like, this is an edited version of the presentation. The full version presented some of the data in multiple ways. Here's a bar graph. Here's a pie chart. Here's a trend line. We just kind of cut it down to a more manageable length. Um, but want to go through this for, and I'll be happy to send this full presentation to anybody and the report. Um, last year, visitor spender, spending uh, continued to increase. It grew another 1.6 million to 47.7 million dollars in direct visitor spending in Hudson in 2017. Uh, visitor spending generated overall 77.5 million in total business sales. Um, as it flowed, flowed through the economy, so that's going to include dollars spent by people who work in the hospitality industry. We'll get into a little bit of that uh, as we go along. Visitor activity sustained a total of 884 jobs with income surpassing $20.4 million. Uh, and it grew to about one point, uh, it grew, outgrew tourism uh, here in Hudson, outgrew statewide growth by 1.5 percentage points in terms of uh, income and job growth. And then finally, um, including uh, direct and induced impacts in tourism, again, that's spending by people who work in that industry. It generated $4.1 million in local taxes, $4.2 million in state taxes, and $4.2 million in federal taxes this past year. Um, this is examples, this kind of gives you an idea of how visitor spending impacts the economy. It comes in through different sectors, and that's one of the things that makes measuring the impact of tourism so challenging, is that it in includes so many different business sectors. So, transportation used by visitors, recreation spending, entertainment, accommodations, retail, and food and beverage, all of that comes through the economy in direct, indirect, and induced impacts. The direct impact is, again, specifically spending directly on those sectors. Um, it also includes induced impact, which is generated again when the employee whose income are generated either directly or indirectly by tourism spend those dollars locally. So that's, and that all leads into production, jobs, wages, and taxes. These are some figures they put together. Um, how important is tourism? This was put together by Tourism Economics, which is the primary group that does this type of research on a national and international level. 
Um, the visitor spending uh, created $47.7 million. That's only $7 million less than the school district budget. The 884 jobs could fill the main theater in the FIP Center four times, and local taxes collection would uh, activity in Hudson reached $3.1 million, which would fully fund the city police department. Again, if those numbers are off, talk to Forest Economics. Um, wanted to get in a little bit about visitor spending. Again, it grew 3.4% in 2017 to $47.7 million direct dollars. This chart at the bottom is a little harder to see, but breaking down that 47.7 million, 8 million is in the lodging industry. That was a 2.32% growth. Food and beverage was 15.6 million, a 6.62% growth. Retail was up to 12.4 million to 1.7, and recreation entertainment was at 6.6, .6, which is an increase of almost 4%. The only sector that went down was the impact tourism has on local transportation spending, but given we don't have a robust local transportation uh, infrastructure, so that is not much of a surprise. Again, this just breaks it down. Um, you see the growth from 2012 to 2017. Uh, it has increased by an average of 5.7% annually since 2012. Um, again, recreation entertainment uh, the last five years has averaged a 9.4% growth, and spending on food and beverages increased by a million dollars last year. It is a kind of trend quarterly, as you might imagine, with different seasons. Uh, we, Mary has spent a lot of time talking about Hudson as a year-round travel destination. Find your season in Hudson, whether it's in the winter coming to the hot air fair, uh, over the summer for some of our other uh, obviously wonderful outdoor recreation opportunities, the fall uh, with the leaves and the Spirit of the St. Croix Art Festival, and again, even in the winter with the hot air fair. But you can see that uh, visitor spending peaks in the third quarter. Uh, with uh, $15.7 million in visitor sales during the third quarter. But our fastest growing quarter uh, last year was quarter one, uh, which increased 12.6% to 8.5 million. We just received those figures for 2018. It was up another 15% over last year. <laughs> that will not be a trend line. That's called Super Bowl. Obviously, there is a lot of natural growth that's taking place, but when we had hotel rooms in this town going for $400 plus, that's actually got, obviously going to bring in additional room tax dollars. Um, this next section is just about methodology and background, and I will not beat you down with this. Again, if you'd like the full presentation, we just got this. I'd be happy to send this to you so you can take a look at what exactly goes into measuring this. It's all sorts of surveys of visitors, they're spending their travel habits along with obviously local economic data that they're able to bring in. Um, and then I will skip to just kind of, there's more of the data sources, but this just gives you an idea of tourism economics, some of the places where they've been brought in uh, to do tourism economic studies. Cal there's California, Georgia, Maryland, New York, there's several states, including Wisconsin, that do this on a statewide level. A lot of major markets throughout the United States, and they're international as well having conducted these types of studies from everywhere from Ontario to Dubai. So reliable data, one of the most trusted companies in business, and we were glad we were able to partner with the state for the first time ever to have this data specifically about Hudson. And that's just about their company. So I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about the report we issued beforehand or the PowerPoint we just over went over, and then some of these questions I made uh, default to Mary on some more of the details. So happy to answer any questions you may have. Anybody? Blake, thank you. That's, uh, that's great information. Congratulations on a uh, on job well done over there at the chamber. That's well, awesome. we have a lot of great partners. This is not us. We have our lot, wonderful lodging properties in town, fantastic restaurants. There's a, it's a destination. And one of the things I, I like to point out is not only is this put money in the economy, but it brings quality of life to our town. A uh, community of $35,000 isn't going to have the wonderful hotels we have in town. Is it going to have 20 plus independent restaurants in the downtown business district? Is it going to have all the wonderful opportunities we have in the retail shops? We don't have those without tourism spending. So it's not only money in our pockets, uh, but it's a, a better way of life for all of us around Hudson. So thanks to all our partners in the tourism industry for that. Anybody? I'll coordinate with Blake and get it on our website too as well. Does that? Yeah. Yes, I'll send you the full. Okay. Perfect. Thanks again, Blake. Perfect. All right. Uh, discussion possible action on Dash for Dogs event on June 2nd, 2018. This came out of public safety, right, Randy? Yes. 
we were wanted to answer, have a, more, a few more questions answered for the event. Wasn't that correct, Joyce? Oh, oh. Jeff, um. do you remember the questions we wanted to ask about that? I think we just wanted to hear what exactly you were planning. There were some details left out, so if you want to give a little presentation uh, um. briefly. So uh, Dash for Dogs <coughs> is a fundraiser that we're trying to do. Uh, money would go to uh, Angel's Pet World, who is also with Coco's Heart. Um, it's just a dog walk. We start at Angel's parking lot. We go uh, across the street down to the river. Just go up <coughs> as high as the dome, like bridge area, and then just come back, uh, walk around, and just end at Angel's uh, parking lot. Our big concern was the crossing yes. from uh, Buckeye through to across the street. That was our concern and w whether you had volunteers in place or were you were going to hire out staff our uh, police department or somebody to police the crossing. Uh, that's actually why we're kind of here saying is there like stuff that we need to do what do we need to provide uh, to get people certified or how do we get people to be able to help us with a uh, crossing. The one gentleman is right there behind you, Chief <laughs> Willem, would be able to help you in assisting trying to figure that out safe-wise because it's not even any safer to move you up a block either. Mm -hmm. And I think the time was at 2 o'clock, was it? Um, 9 a.m.? It starts at 9 a.m. Because that's a busy corner in the summer on a Saturday morning. Oh. So that's our concern. That's the big concern in insurance liability. And I don't know if, Catherine, you had a chance to look through. I haven't seen a certificate. Right. And I mean, that's going to be costly, I would think. A certificate of insurance. insurance. Well, we don't have those for all of our walks, though. We don't require it's them for our walks that I'm aware of. Well, Do we for all of our walks? Yes. I think okay. so. Yes. And I think that was form. also one of the questions. It's on the form, okay. the liability. So I believe that's where our ordinance is drafted. It requires insurance. I think that was one of the questions as well, because of the cross into the street. So you guys were curious as to if we were hiring people out, would we be able to have our own members work as crossing guards as if we have them like... No, you can have your own. I mean, you'd have to coordinate with the police chief as to what they'd be required to do. But okay. most times with these walks, volunteers from the organizations are the ones yeah. that are doing the. We have plenty of volunteers. So we just need to work with you to find out what your qualifications are, and that sort of stuff. Yep. Okay. When is the walk? When is the walk again? Uh, it is June second. Okay. So anyway. Um, it looks, next it looks like this, and it's a school event, so it appears to be a school event, school sponsored event. Um, it's sponsored by the Hudson FFA, which is a school. I thought Activity. I saw their insurance certificate in the, our packet for public war, uh, safety. You saw more than likely their sales and tax exempt certificate. Maybe no, yeah. certificate. Um, but I'm not certain on the permits for events that are less than our special event. Yeah, this would not qualify as a special event. No. So. If we had an insurance requirement. I, I'm not, I mean, I'm not aware that we have for these smaller events, but I could be wrong. I don't know why it's but on we can, the form then. We can check on that. We can coordinate that. We can coordinate that. Yeah. Um, well, if you look under the packet, though, it says insurance required. Yeah, on the form, it, does. it is definitely on the form, but I guess we need to really look if our ordinance requires it. You guys know how many people you're expecting at all? Um, we are hoping for a turnout about about 100 per people, probably uh -huh. less. We're hoping to make this an annual event, so. Um, we'll try and be a little bit faster on making sure that these things. Well, no, I applaud you for doing the effort and trying to do this. It's just we want to make sure it's safe for everybody, yeah. both crossing the street and if animals are there, you know, in our parks, something could happen if they're not muzzled properly, if they're not chained properly. There's 
Just to cover yourselves and the city. Okay. Um, We're going to have to. Look I suppose you could do an approval this. contingent and then have, if Jeff is willing to be kind of be the point person on it, you can coordinate with Jen as far as the insurance if that mm -hmm. if that would be a solution and mm -hmm. we'll get everything resolved for him before the event. Yeah. Okay. Is, is there, okay is there you, any Jeff? other things that you want addressed other than the crossing or the and insurance? We'll yeah, and we'll follow up. We'll, we'll check follow on up the with insurance the insurance with you. Okay. It's easier just to have one person. The, mm -hmm. So, okay. okay. Those are the two big items because we weren't sure how they were going to cross and if we needed the liability. So. Yeah. And again, we'll we'll have this discussion a little bit earlier next year. No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Super. Um, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So, good luck. We'll still be a motion. So I'll move for approval contingent on insurance requirement and work with Jeff Chief Williams on the process. I'll second that. We got a motion, second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. Motions approved. Discussion of possible action on the St. Croix Sailing School lease agreement. up if you'd like. Good evening. Uh, we'd like to have a discussion and possible action on uh, the agreement with a uh, lease agreement with the uh, St. Croix Sailing School. Uh, we've been going back and forth a little bit as you might remember and we have come to a agreement with that's attached. Um, if there's any specific items you'd like to discuss I certainly can do that. Um, we've worked with the sailing school back and forth to get a location which is on the south end of Picnic Point uh, on our most southern portion of uh, Lakefront Park. Uh, we have an area designated on the map that you have included in your packet. If there's any questions on that we can certainly talk about that. Um, or anything else on the agreement. Had we gotten any comments from the general public? In regards to that, putting any structure there. The only person that I have spoken with uh, in regards to having any structures or things down there was uh, uh, Jeff from the St. Croix Marina. Uh, I sat, sat down with him and visited with him. Uh, Colin from the St. Croix Sailing School has visited with him and he expressed his concerns. Um, and I think we have those resolved for now. That's why uh, on this agreement we attached uh, 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 a date and from June 1st to October 31st to see how this goes before we then maybe for next year's, you know, see how it goes this year and considerations and we can modify the lease agreement for next year. That's why we put just for this year only. His concerns were that uh, Doc A is which he can actually sit in his uh, office window and see transient boaters coming and going from Doc A. He said, I'd really not like to have the visibility cut, cut off from you know putting sheds and things up. So the current location that is proposed on the map and after speaking, um, Colin spoke with him and actually it's a very little uh, disturbance uh, of his visibility of that dock. Some of the uh, requirements is uh, and things that we need to do per the lease agreement is to make sure those docks are uh, painted earth tone colors. The, the sheds. I'm sorry, the sheds are painted earth tone. The area is cleaned up. There is some actually buckthorn that are, is higher than the buildings. Uh, they agreed to. Um, remove the buckthorn. There's one tree that's half dead that's leaning over the property. We, kind of, we agreed that we'd share the cost on that. And uh, Jeff was okay with that. The St. Croix Marina was okay with the sight lines and that. This agreement does not include any fencing, which he had concerns about. So that's something if the city council would uh, approve a lease next year, that's something they'd have to consider in that lease. But for this year, there's there's basically the sheds, mm -hmm. and uh, they're gonna um, do some improvements so the sheds can be level. Maybe do some grading or some crushed rock that would not affect the shoreline. There's not going to be any docks that would require any lease, uh, excuse me, permitting from the DNR. 
Um, it's just going to be utilizing that small portion that's identified on the map. Uh, we're expecting that the area be kept clean and presentable. Um, we will be monitoring that. Um, I think that's a, a good program. I think sailing and the river ways we should really promote and um, I hope that we can accommodate the sailing school and make this work. So I'd just like to uh, kind of introduce myself, who I am with the sailing school and just a little bit of history about us. So it'll be very, very brief. Um, so uh, my name is Colin Mueller. I'm the program director down at the sailing school. Uh, I grew up here in Hudson. Uh, I was born at the hospital up on the hill. I went to primary school at Trinity Lutheran, now Trinity Academy. I graduated 2008 from Hudson High School. Uh, the riverfront was a big part of my life growing up. I remember the wooden sculptures downtown. I remember the cartoons on the old Tollbridge Road. I remember the old beach house. I remember the no retaining wall north of the boat landing. I remember the old place, metal play structures at Lakefront Park. These are all fond memories growing up on the Hudson waterfront. But as I grew, the wooden statues floated away. That's what I was told anyway. Um, the paintings were graffitied, covered up. The lakefront playground turned to plastic. And now there's a nice walkway north of the landing. I enjoyed watching these changes as downtown Hudson grew, so did the waterfront. So growing up walking down that old Tollbridge Road, I would look out at the sailboats and wish I could hoist a sail and sail down the river. At the time, there was no way for me to do that. I could only sit on the side of the levee and watch the boats embark. I remember always asking, always saying to my parents, one day I'll have a boat out in that mooring field. Fast forward to 2014, I started working with the St. Croix Sailing School. I'd found the place that I was looking for as a kid walking up and down that old bridge road. It was a place where kids and adults could get out on the water, experience the joy of boating on the St. Croix River. I was no longer a kid, but I knew that I could be a part of making that next kid's dream come true. So as the program director of the St. Croix Sailing School, I've devoted all my time, um, sometimes volunteering, um, to make that child to dream of mine a reality for St. Croix um, Valley youth. Um, quick, the mission of the St. Croix Sailing School is to provide safe, affordable boating education to youth and adults throughout the St. Croix River Valley. Over the past 10 years, we have had over 2,000 students pass through our doors, and we are committed to providing safe, fun, and adventurous programs for youth who along the way learn the lifelong skills of teamwork, self-reliance, problem solving, and respect for our national waterway. We believe that sailing provides a unique opportunity for growth and discovery. Our program also allows youth the opportunity to leave technology behind and just be surrounded by nature. For adults, the program gives everybody an affordable chance to experience the majesty of the St. Croix River. In seeking this temporary location that Tom talked about, we're, working, we're looking to work with the city of Hudson, maybe someday partner with the Parks and Rec Department like many sailing programs have around the country. Um, locally, the St. Paul with Lake Phelan, Minneapolis with the Minneapolis Sailing Center, the Milwaukee Community Sailing Center with the Milwaukee Parks. Uh, more nationally, there's the um, Burlington, Vermont Community Sailing Center in Bur Burlington, um, and then the Hudson River Community Sailing Center in New York City. Um, I have a list of more. If anybody would like to see those, I could pass it around. Um, so having this temporary location that Tom has talked about will allow us to continue providing the sailing lessons along with other boating activities in the future. So our long-term goal is in line with that waterfront redevelopment plan. Uh, as proposed in the development plan, um, sorry, as proposed in the, in the plan, SCS would love to move into a newly remodeled Buckeye garage when that time comes. In that space, we'd be able to open a community boating center open to all. This community boating center can be the go-to place to learn boating safety from sailing to small power boats. This community boating center would provide river access to Hudson residents and bring in residents from other areas to our beautiful city on the St. Croix. So until that time, we need this temporary location um, with the proposed lease that you have in front of you. So this lease will allow us to continue serving area youth and adults, and we're very grateful for this current offer from the city to lease this small corner of parkland. Uh, we will not have a location. Um, as the current lease states, we would have to move our two buildings off the park in October. Um, we will not have a location to move them to, but as Tom said, uh, we may be able to discuss that further after this trial period has um, ended. 
So being a 501c3, we are an all volunteer board. I'm the one employee, part-time over the winter and full-time over the summer programming. We're committed to affordable access to the river. We budget to break even every year and rely on donors to help with boat maintenance and this year's moving costs. Having, having this lease from the city will allow us to continue to put our resources into improving the program and saving for when a more permanent option becomes available. Having the ability to have this lease will also mean that the St. Croix Sailing School can become one of the 36 U.S. Sailing accredited sailing centers. U.S. Sailing is the governing body of the sport and having this accreditation will help put Hudson on the map and the St. Croix River on the map as a sailing destination. Maybe one day an Olympic sailor starts their training on the St. Croix River. St. Croix Sailing School has the top of the line insurance through the Gowrie Group. This company specializes in insurance for sailing organizations around the country. Um, if you'd like to see our insurance plan, I have a one sheet um, I can pass around if you're interested. Um, thank you again for your time considering our proposal. We hope to continue working with the city to grow the sport of sailing and provide programs for the community to learn safe boating practices. Doing so will help ensure the community of Hudson has safe, affordable access to the St. Croix River on all types of watercraft. So if you have any questions for me specifically about our program or what we're looking to do. I do thank you, Colin. Paul? So, so big picture is that um, this is kind of a temp temporary stopgap until just for the summer, as I understand it. Yes. And then the goal would be to evaluate that maybe to see in the future. Mm -hmm. So our goal is with the new waterfront development plan. Um, if you look in the SEH handout, um, mm -hmm. there's a little section on the sailing school and how we can be integrated within the park plan. So this is kind of a, a place where we can continue running our program because we are um, with the new development where we currently are, or having to move um, our buildings. So we'll be running classes out of the park, ensuring that we are still providing um, public access to the park. We won't be just like taking up the whole park with our boats, ensuring Jeff will always be able to see ADOC. We work closely with the marina. But yeah, so this is a stopping gap until um, we can work with the city, work with the um, redevelopment plan and really become uh, my five-year goal here, 10-year goal out, is to become this community boating center that can attract um, people from around the St. Croix River Valley just to get out on the water affordably. And we are also looking to maybe do power boat safety classes down the road, maybe working with the DNR so we have a safe river for power boaters as well as sailors, mm -hmm. canoers, and kayakers, um, just kind of opening up this, this um, resource that this city has. Okay. Anybody else? Nice job, Colin. Thank you. Good luck over there. Thanks. So I guess the Public Works Committee and staff would recommend, recommend our recommendation would be to recommend the approval of the lease agreement that you have before you with the St. Croix Sailing School beginning June 1st, 2018 through October 31st, 2018 at a rate of $100 a month, which is consistent with our other uh, leases that we have um, with other um, uh, different groups I move we approve it but I'd like to have make sure we have the insurance and in file of the all part of the, the certificate agreement. yeah I would second motion to second any discussion all those in favor all right, all right. opposed motions approved thank you thanks Tom uh, having computer issues right now uh, discussion of possible action on ordinance 14-18 repealing city of Hudson code of or uh, code of ordinance chapter 246-2 and amending section 246-3 to reflect changes in Wisconsin state statutes eliminating knives from the definition of a dangerous weapon and limiting the authority of local government to regulate hunting within the city limits chief hello so yeah several years ago state statutes have changed regarding knives as being considered dangerous weapons and they were eliminated from that definition though our ordinance 246-2 still had them listed as prohibited items of possession so we felt it necessary to change the ordinance um, likewise with 246-3 uh, the state passed uh, legislation limiting the authority of local governments to be able to regulate hunting um, 246-3 uh, prohibited the discharge of a bow within city limits period uh, with the new statute it gives regulations on how discharge of a bow should be made legal in 
uh, local municipalities. So that's what these changes address. Okay. I'll move to suspend the rules. Second. Got a motion and second to suspend. Roll call. Yes. <laughs> More set. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Dezeal. Yes. Weber. Yes. Paul. Yes. Motions approved. Rules are suspended. Move to adopt ordinance 14 18. Second. Motion second to adopt. Any discussion? Yeah, yeah but I understand the, uh, the hunting thing. We've been basically prohibited. From barring hunting, but why are we not allowed to consider knives dangerous weapons? And what's the distinction? Not, not just in and of itself, like the possession of a knife in and of itself is not considered a dangerous weapon by state law anymore. And I, I believe they even removed the uh, switchblade knives from that definition as well. And the state has preempted that yeah. area of law, yeah. saying it actually you know, is a preemption yeah, on that mm -hmm. as well. That we're right. going to decide these things. I understand. I understand that on the on the archery. I mean, I read about that. Knew that was coming. Okay. Anybody else? So, can I ask a couple questions? So, from your perspective as as police chief, you would you would or would not consider like a knife a dangerous weapon depends on the circumstances <laughs> <laughs> right but i mean I, i'm trying to ask if you're comfortable with the removal of that classification as a local police officer yeah i am you know i, I still don't think that they can possess knives in school and things like that right but out and about at fleet farm right. you know i don't think if you're carrying a pocket knife that it should be considered or even a knife in a sheath should be considered a dangerous weapon and the current ordinance would uh that it's on the books would basically call it that yes and as far as the hunting piece of this is there um is there a big demand to hunt within city limits or where's like where's that coming from i i don't know um all we're trying to do is get more in line with what the state statutes and and uh the fact that we completely prohibited the discharge of a bow in the city is actually illegal as far as the state statute is concerned so oh. we have to kind of change that one so Catherine would yeah. that be true that we're yeah what the statute allows is exactly what we put in the ordinance it allows up to 100 yards and we did the 100 yards 100 yards of a yeah, building that's the statute just plain says this is the only way you can regulate I guess what I'm trying to get at is if we if we pass this there's not going to be a lot of people running around hunting within city limits that's what I'm trying to get at I, I wouldn't <coughs> anticipate it but I guess I can't answer that question okay but we couldn't enforce we, we can only enforce yeah, what we have but the state statute right. will be dropped in a, so the yeah. state trumps the city state basically trumps the city. Yeah. Okay. they've <clears throat> the state has decided that it's on this issue that they're we have to be compliant with in particular to bows it's still it's illegal to discharge a firearm in the city limits correct yes okay that helps yeah thank you anybody else um so did we have a motion we did okay mm -hmm. anybody else all those in favor aye. Aye. aye opposed motions approved thanks chief Discussion and possible action on approval of an agreement between the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation and the City of Hudson to accept an idle sites grant award in the amount of $500,000. Mike? Yes, thank you. Uh, the City of Hudson has been awarded the grant for the idle sites program through the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation for an amount up to $500,000. Nice will, job. Thank you. This will go towards site clearance. They've already started, obviously, <laughs> and demo of the existing um, dog track facility. Um, it was really a big effort between city staff, uh, WSB, the developers, um, engineering firm. Uh, we, it, it all came together pretty quickly. We had a, a pretty firm deadline and obviously the property had to close. Uh, the way this grant works is the, uh, there's at least $1.7 million in private funds um, to leverage that 500,000, which is disbursable once the developer certifies those costs to the city and we accept it um, and then submit to the to the state the other piece is that um, one remaining piece we have to, to get done is uh, get a first phase development agreement approved 
um, so that we can draw on those funds and uh, reimburse the developer for those costs incurred. So exciting. It's good. It's, it, it helps a lot with the project. I'll move we accept approval of the agreement for the uh, grant award. Want more specific? No. Okay, no, that's, good. that's fine. I'll second. You can describe good. it as in the issue. <laughs> like, Just as described in the issue <laughs> sheet. Is there a uh, second? <laughs> second. Second. Everybody. All right. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Nicely done, Mike. Thanks. Discussion possible action on the final development plans for Neo Electric Facility, Neo Electrical Facility at 2180 Jack Row Drive, Neo Electrical Solutions. Uh, Neo has submitted the site plan for a approximately 14,000 square foot facility to be located on the Jack Row Drive extension, so that would be immediately south of the new XL Energy Service Center. Um, there's some space uh, for future planned expansions of 2,800 square feet and 7,500 square feet respectively. Um, plan commission and staff recommend approval with conditions as identified in your staff reports. I'll move to approve. Second. Got a motion second for approval. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's approved. Thanks, Mike. Uh, discussion possible action on appointment of Jim Weber to the Design Review Committee. Move to approve. Second. Got a motion second to approve. Any discussion? All those um, in being new, what is the Design Review Committee? Mike, There's would Mike. you like to explain the Design <laughs> Review Committee briefly? <laughs> Everybody kind of looked around up here, so we'll have you do that. <laughs> It's that downtown district overlay. Oh. So for appeals for decisions that the plan commission would make um, pertaining to that specific B3 zoning designation, they would okay. be heard by the it, it review committee. It was previously chaired by John, by John. Hoggett. Okay. Right. Uh, anybody else? All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. Okay, uh, we're going to take uh, these proclamations uh, out of order. There are only two, so just substituting. Brandon, would you like to come forward? <laughs> so uh, they played a little joke on me here, and uh, they couldn't find a lot smaller than this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you did that? <laughs> I need my 250. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, the Emergency Medical Services Week proclamation. To designate the week of May 20th to 26th, 2018 as Emergency Medical Services Week, whereas Emergency Medical Services is a vital public service, and whereas the members of emergency medical services teams are ready to provide life-saving care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and whereas access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rate of those who experience sudden illness or injury, and whereas emergency medical services has grown to fill a gap by providing important out-of-hospital care, including preventative medicine, follow-up care, and access to telemedicine, and whereas the emergency medical services system consists of first responders, emergency medical technicians, paramedics, emergency medical dispatchers, firefighters, police officers, educators, administrators, pre-hospital nurses, emergency nurses, emergency physicians, trained members of the public, and other out-of-hospital medical care providers, and whereas the members of emergency medical services teams, whether career or volunteer, engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of emergency medical services providers by designating Emergency Medical Services Week now 
Therefore, I, Rich O'Connor, Mayor of the City of Hudson, Wisconsin, in recognition of this event, do hereby proclaim the week of May 20th to 26th, 2018, as Emergency Medical Services Week. Thank you, Brandon. Thank, Thank you. you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. Tom, would you like to come forward? Yeah, sir. Um, another Tom out there? <laughs> so we have a proclamation for National Public Works Week. Whereas public work, public work services provided in our community are an integral part of our citizens' everyday lives, and whereas the support of an understanding and informed citizenry is vital to the efficient operation of public work systems and programs such as water, sewers, streets and highways, public buildings, and solid waste collection, and whereas the health, safety, and comfort of this community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities as well as their planning, design, and construction are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform. Now therefore, I, Rich O'Connor, Mayor of the City of Hudson, do hereby proclaim the week of May 20th, 2018 as National Public Works Week. Uh, in the City of Hudson, and I call upon all citizens and civic organizations to acquaint themselves with the issues involved in providing our public works and to recognize the contributions which public works officials make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. Thank you very much. Tom, thank you very much. Yeah. I appreciate it. As long as Tom is up here, um, I was notified last Friday that Tom will be retiring in September after 40 years of service to the city. So he said it was okay if I announced that tonight. So. We will have recognition we'll see. for him. Um, yep. and we'll see. <laughs> Brandon and Tom will get uh, another uh, uh, document that will be signed, and we'll get that to you guys. So, uh, any communications? Anybody have uh, anything for future agendas? Anybody? Oh, thanks. Randy? No. Nope. It's not what I was asking. Move to adjourn. <laughs> motion and second to adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion's approved. We stand adjourned. Thank you, everybody.